Peptides are sick. Thank you. Peptides are definitely signaling therapy. Shockwave is a signaling therapy via mechanotransduction, um, PRP, exosomes, and others. So it's just important to look at all of these and think, you know, how are they similar and how are they different? So we'll do, I have a bunch of case studies on here as well. There is a component that's on the ESWT, the acoustic wave therapy, shockwave therapy. I won't go into great detail on that because you've all heard it before, but I will um, do a little bit of a little bit of it. So obviously with regenerative medicine, we're all trying to do the same thing. We're trying to address the baseline genetics. I mean, that is so foundational and the epigenetics that, you know, um, determine the phenotype of the patient, of the person. And everyone's phenotype is different. Even identical twins will have different phenotypes and that's been studied. So it's really important to understand that. And I think I talked about that in one of my last lectures with you, where when you look at the phenotypes of the immune system in identical twins, depending upon their exposures, they're going to be completely different. Uh, methylation, we know, is really, really important, PPR gamma as genetics. And we know that when the immune system is polarized, this is Dr. Halasa talks a lot about polarization of the immune system, or what I used to say prior to his polarization talks is it's dysregulated. In one way or the other, it's either tending towards autoimmunity, whether it's viral or TH17, or it's tending towards polarized towards bacterial or fungal, but essentially understanding what's happening with the immune system and measuring, I mean, now it's much more common since COVID to measure IL-6, um, TNF-alpha, et cetera, because those things are a little bit more understood. Redox, you've heard about that, you know, forever and ever, and we know oxidative stress. And what I would pose is that you know, oxidative stress in the extracellular fluid, which is also called the extracellular matrix, which is also called the, the, um, the fluid that's, that's surrounding the cells where the fascia is, that if that is unwell and it's oxidatively stressed and rusting or dirty, then that's going to be reflective of other parts of the body. Inflammation, we all know that's the standard American disease basic cellular health, mitochondrial health, those are the same, and then detoxification pathways. So these are just things that we always sh should be looking at in order to understand where's the first place to intervene for the, for the particular patient with a series of symptoms. So in order to get to peak wellness, you know, regardless of how, if you want peak wellness, whatever that means for your patients, you're going to have to start at the bottom. And this lifestyle modifications, no matter what we do, if someone's not willing to change the way that the, the way that they handle stress or whether they, you know, meditate or manage stress effectively, whether they sleep appropriately, I think that's number, stress is number one, sleep is number two. Number three is food. And this is all based upon the time of a day that, that these things impact us. Um, and then movement, and then ultimately um, <clears throat> the other things that we just looked at. So when we're looking at lifestyle modifications, we've got to address those. I think that's at least 50% of the problem for most people. Um, and remember, Lifestyle modifications, if you're 40, what you did when you were 20 or 30 is still impacting you because your body is a library of every exposure you've ever had, whether it's mono from kissing disease at age 18 or whether you know it's anything else that you've been exposed to, that is a memory system that your body has. So it's really important to remember that because those things never really go away. What we have to do is learn to manage them and help the patient manage them, not, not control them. So it may be that food is our medicine and somebody may need IV nutritional therapy, you all do that, or oral supplementation or changing their food, whether it's an AIP diet, autoimmune paleo diet, or whatever diet you prefer. I am not a one size fits all. I don't believe in keto. I don't believe in autoimmune paleo. I think it's very individual depending upon what the patient's situation is. We also have to think about hormones as being medicinal signaling cell therapies as well. Um, cortisol and DHEA, we know they're yin and yang. Insulin and IGF-1, yin and yang. I'm really, really loving the Boston Heart testing that shows us beta cell function because even when the A1C is low, the hemoglobin A1C may be 5.2 or 5.3, you can have really poor beta cell function. And as a result, you could have extreme insulin resistance. And I have a patient like that here, and you could also have reduced insulin sensitivity, and they could be tending to 
towards diabetes, even though their A1C may be 5.2. So IGF-1 and insulin are really important. I don't think it makes sense to measure a glucose without an insulin because the sugar means nothing without knowing what the insulin level was to get that sugar where it is. I learned that by having diabetes. So estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, we know that they're medicinal signaling therapies. We'll look at that a little bit. In terms of thinking about aromatase induced, whether it's a man who wants to reduce his estrogen because he's, he's got excess testosterone, which is going to estrogen, or a woman who has breast cancer and we give them an aromatase inhibitor, then essentially they will have, they will dry up. They will have no lubrication from these steroid hormones and they will have significant pain. Arom aromatase induced um, myofascial syn pain syndrome is, is very, very common. Um, and then, you know, MSCs, medicinal signaling cells, PRP, and we know PRP is composed of many growth factors, including, you know, IGF-1, fibroblast growth factor, VEG, VEGF, VEGF-A, VEGF-B, VEGF-C, and others. I mean, there's so many growth factors. The problem with PRP is that we don't characterize it. We, you know, we, it's too expensive to have the equipment to char characterize it. And peptides, we still have to be creative about how we can get them in order to help our patient optimize their well-being and get back to peak wellness. So lifestyle modifications are essential. So fascia, which we it, conventionally in medicine, I mean, I think most of us are old enough to think of fascia as being inert because we just threw it away and we got to the muscles and the nerves within the muscles. But fascia is like saran wrap that goes in and out of every myofibril, every neurofibril, every single fibril of the body. And it's a very bioactive system. So it's surrounding every cell within every organ. And it's basically signaling. That's where the signaling of these particular uh, med medicinal signaling therapies occur. And I love, love, love this picture. Because when you think about very early in embryology, week two to three, we're a one cell layer blastula. And the somites will arise from here for specialization to become smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, skeletal muscle, and all of the other things. But when we look at this and we think that here we have in the inner, the dark, this inner little line is the ectoderm. So that becomes our skin, et cetera. Here in the yellow inner line, we have the endoderm, but all of this pink stuff all around is the mesoderm and it forms a figure eight. So it's contiguously and continuously surrounding all the organs. So the mesoderm forms the fascia. So the fascia is everywhere. You will see it surrounding every single fibril of every organ of the body. And the other thing about the um, mesoderm is that when you look at here at the notochord, um, right here in the center, you've got all of these uh, particular mesenchymal stem cells that are you know, joined together by these reticular fibers. So when we think about you know, what's happening in the fascia, that's where many of the stem cells lie. And if we want to activate them, there has to be the best juice in this, you know, extracellular layer. You might call it that. You might call it the mesoderm. You might call it the fascia. You might call it the extracellular matrix. That's what I prefer to call it, the ECM. So this is, these are all sitting in the ECM and the ECM has to, has to have a balance of oxidation and antioxidation. It has to be very well nourished in order for us to activate these stem cells and for them to become tissue that we need for healing. The other thing I like about this is when we see the amniotic fluid, I use a lot of what are now called cytosomes or exosomes in order to treat my patients. And basically they're components of the amniotic fluid. So when you think about how you know juicy this amniotic fluid is and what the different uh, growth factors that are are within this amniotic fluid that can be characterized by the companies that make them, it's really, really important. So I continue to use a lot of a variety of um, modalities in order to activate the fascia, including you know, acoustic wave shockwave therapy, which when we get movement in here, we'll get flow of, of, nu of nutrient dense, hopefully fluid extracellular matrix, which will be able to activate the mesenchymal stem cells. I don't think it makes sense to put a lot of stem cells or anything in 
into a person, regardless of their age, unless they we know that they have the juice within this fluid in order to feed those stem cells so that they can become something. This is a fantastic video that you must watch, Strolling Under the Skin, and this will be on the website. I'm not going to go through it, but basically it's Jean-Claude Gambarteau, who's from France, and he has outlined an amazing, awe-inspiring video for about 30 minutes of what happens under the skin and how relatively disorganized, yet organized, the uh, matrices of the fascia are. You will love, love, love this video. And this is the, the, um, the, the location on the web where you can find it. And I strongly, strongly recommend that you watch that later. I could play it, but I think you can watch that on your own. Here's the fascia. We have a bodysuit. We have a cat suit. Sorry about that. We have this cat suit. And in this cat suit, you know, basically, we know that there's different densities of this fascia. Some of it is thinner, some of it is thicker. Obviously, in the thicker places, we don't want it to split. We can see here on the right hand side the epi, the peri, and the endomesium. And this is true for also the nurium. There's an epi, peri, and endonurium. And the fascia is all of this white stuff. And then in between every myofibril of each compartment is the fascia. And that is the way that we get signaling and communication for each of the fi these fibrils and the fibrils of the different compartments to act together. And that happens within the nervous system as well. This is within the muscular system and you can see here's the bone. So it's very, very important and it's very, very intricate the way that this fascia all of this white stuff, this white stuff communicates. It's like saran wrap that goes in and out and in and out and in and out. And I think of it as oxygen, more than oxygen in the body because it's everywhere and it's communicating front to back and side to side and above and below. It's quite, quite remarkable. The fascia allows for a three-dimensional glide. So you can be gliding in different dimensions at all times, depending upon you know, the way that the fascia is structured. And you can see the layers that are going up in, in, the, you know, in the back, closer towards the latissimus dorsi, and then down towards the tensor fascia lata. In the bottom, you can see that they're going in a different direction. So you can have a three-dimensional glide. If there's an injury at any point, whether it's in the back, the neck, or the TFL and the gluteus and, and the, and the, and the um, butt, basically you will get a reduction in this three-dimensional glide. And that's really important. And these are the pe people, Dr. Antonio Stecco, MD, Dr. Carlos, Carlos Stecco, MD. Antonio's in New York and he does, he's a physiatrist and his sister is in um, Italy in Padua and she's a, an, an anatomy professor and she works closely on the fascia and they've written on pain and headache and how the densification of the fascia and the more dense it is because of an injury can really impact pain. So this is just another perspective for looking at pain signaling and something that we can really think about. You know, when we did anatomy and we looked at muscles, we tore off all of this fascia, but here is a piece of steak and there's fascia throughout it. Any little layer here will have fascia there. And this is our tissue. This is Tom Myers, who's a fascia expert as well. And basically we can see all of the fascia overlying and in between each layer of that tissue, which is going to allow for movement of the muscle because the neuromuscular junction lies within the fascia. And I'll show you, show you another picture of that. The muscles are in, the neurons are in the fascia, the neurons that innervate the muscle to move. So we are like a very elaborate piece of origami in terms of the fascia. And this is, those are the words of David Lasondak. So the fascia connects all the way from the top of the cranium right down to the toe. So if there's a block in the calf, for example, it's going to disrupt the fascia above and the fascia below. And when we do shock wave therapy or acoustic wave therapy, as you know from Gearhart, we don't start right on the point of pain. We have to open up the flow above and below the point of pain before we even go to the point of pain. And that's something that commonly I do with athletes. If you tear off the fascia, you can see that just overlying this muscle group from the top of the cranium right down to the toe in these muscles, there's fascia. Every layer from the outermost to the innermost will contain a, you know, multiple layers of fascia. And that's really, really important to understand. 
And here, I love this photo because a lot of people come in with low back pain or butt pain or uh, sciatic pain, et cetera. And when you're treating that pain, you know, that's in this region here or emanating from this region here, you must understand the relationships. You have to understand the gluteus maximus muscle will connect to the IT band. So you've got to work all of these different types of material. The gluteus maximus is muscle more. We've got an IT band that's very thick and it's gluteal fascia. The fascia from the gluteus will connect right to the iliotibial band. And then we see over here, the tensor fascia lata, the TFL. And if we don't understand these relationships and we will never be able to really open up that space and longitudinally and sustainably, release pain. So I think it's really important to understand the relationships with it, between the different types of fascia through the muscle, through an IT band, and through the TFL, the tensor fascia lata. This shows that we are balanced. You know, the tension in the anterior fascia and muscles, but I'm thinking more fascia, is yin yang balanced. And I think as osteopaths, most of you know this, and I, I, I hope I'm not insulting anybody. I'm, I'm excited because I'm learn this, um, but willing to learn more always, this is, you know, the back and there's yin and yang, and they've got to be, you know, remember when they used to say, well, if you want your back to stop hurting, strengthen your muscles, your abdominal muscles. Well, there really needs to be a balance in the tension in order for, you know, the back and the abdomen not to hurt. I think that this is a brilliant photo here on the right, where it shows the abdominal fascia. These are the abdominal muscles that would be our six packs with the fascia surrounding them, a big picture of the fascia, a gross picture as opposed to a microscopic. And basically this fascia goes in and out as it goes around to the vertebra. So if you have back pain, you can have abdominal issues, gut issues. If you have gut issues, you can have back pain because the pain always comes from the inflammatory chemicals or mediators. And those inflammatory mediators Yep. Okay. So, and basically, you know, I, I just think this is fascinating and I have treated people with, you know, pain in the abdomen by treating their back and pain in the back by treating their abdomen and they have relief. And it's, it's, it, this makes sense. Um, here's the lower leg compartment. Again, this is a bone. This is a bone, right? This is the fibula, this is the tibia. And basically we're showing again, how the fascia is such a prominent component of this underneath the subcutaneous, the skin and the subcutaneous tissue. So we've really, if we want to get movement and flow deeper underneath the skin and the subcutaneous tissue, we've got to get rid of the compression, the tension, the, the tensional force in that fascia and get flow there. This is a picture we looked at the um, epimesium, which is the muscle. Here we're looking at the epineurium, the endoneurium and the nerve fibers. And again, the myelin sheaths and all the nerve fibers and the fascicle, they are all surrounded by fascia. So the nerves don't like to be compressed. The nerves don't like to be in tension, tensional stretch. They wanna be in a state that feels comfortable for them where they can receive nu nutrients and fluid from the, the material around them, the fascia, and where they can, you know, just um, release the, the, the metabolic byproducts. This is also fascia as a whole, and we can see this den dense network of nerve fibers that's in the thoracolumbar fascia. And basically these nerves, I just think of them as standing up you know, in the fascia, trying to innervate the cells around them to get whether it's smooth muscle contraction of the GI tract, whether it's um, uh, skeletal muscle contraction of uh, the calf or the, the quad or the hamstring, whatever it is. And another interesting thing that I think about in a typical muscle, that there are three times as many sensory nerves as motor nerves. So the sensory vasomotor and the motor, we've got 45%, 15% roughly of sensory to motor. And then we've got these involuntary vasomotor nerves that are still being innerv innervated, the vasomotor, by the nervous system. So 80% of the sensory information in the body, pain, heat, temperature, touch, 
is coming from the interstitial fluid where there are interstitial nerves. So if we wanna treat pain, if we wanna treat an injury, it's really important that we understand that. I always think it's a good sign if the body, if there's no numbness, because it means that if the, if the nerves have pain or if there's pain in an area, because it generally lets us know that they're screaming for help, they're asking for help and we can intervene and likely, you know, make, make, you know, make it better. This is showing a muscle spindle, again, paramecium, interacting with the collagen network. The collagen network is basically the fascial network. The tendons are fascial as well. And basically the, the, um, the muscle spindle capsule and the Golgi tendon organ are communicating through the fascia to let the muscle and the bone and the body, the brain, central nervous system, know where, uh, you know, how much tension is on that muscle, how much compression is on that muscle and where it is in space. So again, the nerves are very, very important. Here's the photo that I love. This is all fascia. And basically these are free nerve endings. Remember they're 80% of our sensory input accounting for pain, temperature, et cetera, burning if people are burning. And so we wanna understand whether these nerves, these free nerve endings are compressed or there's tensional torque on them. We wanna understand the physics of it. And we need to open up this space so that they, they, there can be flow in these interstitial spaces and the nerves can feel alive and not, and not stressed about what could be happening to them and whether or not they will die. So injury, inflammation, and pain will really begin in the fascia. Um, elasticity is appropriate elasticity. Obviously, you know, we don't want to be purely elastic like Ehrlich Danler syndrome. We want to have some elasticity and then also, you know, just um, what's that word? Just re recoiling back into the right form. And one of the things, you know, it, that, I mean, this is Tom Brady when he was at the Patriots and I worked at TB12 as the medical director and the fascial work and the nutrient work and the IV work and all of that that we did was all about elasticity, appropriate elasticity, so you could recoil into the form. Now, pregnancy is another example of um, elasticity and recoil. We want the uterus to expand and we want it to recoil at the end of at the end of a pregnancy. So fascial, you know, the people who are the goats really know about fascial elasticity and they value it. So, you know, at TB12 or with Tom's trainer, who many of you may know, who's by his side all the time, they are constantly working the tissue. They are constantly hydrating in order to um, essentially allow for flow in the fascia. It's not just the muscles. We want those muscles to contract you know, obviously through use of the nervous system. And then we want them to recoil and be relaxed again. And that's why we can, how we can most importantly stay strong and live, long and live. And we can also prevent injury. And I just think, you know, thinking about that dough and pizza dough and really rolling that out and managing, I mean, rolling is a great thing rolfing, whatever we do. I mean, there's so many ways of doing it and whatever is your expertise of the way that you, you know how to move that tissue and feel it with your hands, that's probably the most beneficial thing that we can do. So the Fascial Tissue Research Congress, they meet every year, this meeting, uh, they didn't meet this year, but we'll meet again in um, Montreal in September of 2022. And Helene Langevin, who runs the NIH pain uh, program, she was previously in Boston here at the Brigham working intensively on fascia. And so it's really important. And basically when you go to these research um, congresses, they don't really understand the clinical components like you all do and like I'm trying to do. So they're really trying to understand injury, and then tissue adaptation. How can we diagnose this, make consensus statements? And it's really important. They do understand, you know, essentially that the fascial system is a continuum. It's three-dimensional, allows for the glide. It's made up of collagen containing connective tissue. It permeates the entire body and it allows all the body systems to operate in an integrated manner. 
So that's why it has to connect. And that's why medicinal signaling therapies have to work there. Injuries to the fascia cause a loss of performance, a loss of the ability to walk, whether it's recreationally or high performance sports, and has a really important role in the perpetuation and the continuation and propagation of musculoskeletal skeletal disor disorders like low back pain. And I don't know if any of you know Kevin Pauza, who runs the Spine Institute in Texas, but this is exactly the kind of work that he does to try to mitigate the movement of these uh, inflammatory chemokines and mediators through the fascial tissue. Um, a better understanding of fascial tissue adaptation dynamics to mechanical loading. So mechanical receptors are involved as well as to biochemical, the extracellular matrix is really important. The interstitial fluid is really important. And the more we can understand this, we will be able to understand how to prevent injury, how to improve sports rehab, athletic performance, and also recreational rehab as well in physical therapy or in an osteopath's office. Thank goodness. So we really need to understand the molecular and cellular responses through mechanotransduction, -transduc through injury, through medicinal signaling therapies. Um, and then also we have to understand the macro level, the mechanical properties as well. So it's really, really important for us to think about aging and to manage physiological challenges, particularly injury with aging. So we want to target the fascial tissue. And we all have to be involved in this. I think right now it's a lot of researchers at the Fascial Tissue Research Congress. It would be great to have more of you, more clinical people to talk about what their experiences are because they really don't even know what we do. This is a great um, slide. I love this slide. I apply this, which says the acute phase of joint injury. It looks at the acute, the subacute, and then the chronic phase. But whether it's joint injury or any injury, I think it's important because whenever there's an injury, there's a reflex activation. And the goal is to shut down the system that's been injured. You know, even if it's fatty liver, we want to reduce the activation of those particular cells. So when, when it's a joint the muscle that's attached to the joint or moves the joint, if the joint is injured, the muscle responds. The muscle has to have some signaling through some way, which is the fascia. So if we get a reflex inhibition of muscle activation so that it becomes more fatigued and more tired and it doesn't really respond, you're not gonna move. You're gonna allow the joint to heal. Obviously you're gonna get pain through those um, interstitial neurons, 80% of which, um, our sensory, you're going to get an altered muscle function. And even when I studied physiology back in the early eighties, we weren't really, we didn't know then that just like we didn't know when I was teaching science that about the genome and the phenotype and the, and the genotype, basically we didn't know that you could change your muscle fiber type, you know, from slow to fast and fast to slow. But basically with an injury, the muscle that's on that, that's connecting to that joint and moving that joint will transition to fast fibers. And that makes sense because we want those fibers to fatigue more quickly so that we allow for rest so that potentially the joint can heal. We also get a transition of the macrophages from M2 to N1 and within the muscle, and those are all inflammatory. So infl inflammation, change in the muscle fiber type, increased fatigability, weakness and tired of the muscle so that it can't work that hard so that you don't injure the joint even more. Simultaneously, if this continues, you can see with that inflammation, you're gonna get fibrosis. And that's the one thing that we don't want to happen. We're gonna get increased collagen expression and we're gonna fibrose the tissue. So when we think about relaxin and elastin and the other components, that are within the soft tissue, within the collagen tissue, which in, within the fascia, we're gonna shift our composition of those and fibrosis is gonna be a tough thing to heal. We're also going to get an inflammatory response, not just from the macrophage transition, but also from the um, adipose tissue that surrounds that. We're gonna get an increase in fat cells being deposited. We're gonna have the inflammatory response from the fat cells. We're gonna get a transition, not just in the muscle uh, to an inflammatory phenotype of macrophages. We're gonna get more TNF uh, and also IL-1 beta, and we're going to have more an increase in inflammation, inflammation, which is basically gonna increase fibrosis and collagen expression to make this a very difficult area to move the longer we don't 
attend to the tissue above and below the injury. So you're going to get compromised tissue dynamics. You're not going to be able to move the joint and the muscles the way that you are. You're going to have a difference, a change in the force generation. And ultimately, the pain is going to continue. If we get to the point where, where we have mus complete fatty infiltration and muscle atrophy, that's a problem, right? The nerves will then ultimately become quiescent and that's not good. So we definitely want to address an injury as early as we can, even with, you know, touching tissue movement, acoustic wave therapy, peptides, making sure hormones are appropriate, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, et cetera, making sure adiponectin, adipose tissue, leptin, and all of those, ghrelin with, with, uh, IGF-1, that all of those are appropriate because if we do that, we're going to be less likely to get atrophy and fatty infiltration of the tissue. So you've seen this before. This is our cat suit, basically allowing us to move. And this, these are the muscles. And basically, this is in the, in the thoracolumbar fascia. And essentially, it's, we're seeing the fascia communicating around. This is the matrix. This here in C is the extracellular matrix which is a semi-liquid, you know, kind of looks gooey and like bubbles in there, kind of like the dough would look like if you just rolled it out and rolled it out, these little bubbles in here. But this is where the nutrients are. This is where we have to remove the waste and we have to move it along the fascia. This is where mechanotransduction takes place. This is where the nerves are. This is where we communicate to the, the nucleus of a cell in order to... Um, in order to shift the gene transcription to get to a healing phenotype. So very, very important that we understand the relationship and how we go from Mac from 40,000 feet on the left to four feet on the right and think about how are we gonna change four feet to affect 40,000 feet, which is what the pa patient feels. Here's mechano disruption, mechano transduction. So this is the extracellular matrix on the outside of the cell. And also this is where BPC and thymus and beta-4 will work in the talin, actin, myosin, both BPC and TB4 work here. And that's why athletes use them, you know, they're, and that's why they're banned because basically when you use TB4 and, um, BPC, they will activate the integrins and they'll work to heal the talin actin myosin network so that it stays intact and communicates appropriately to the nucleus and activates appropriate genes for gene transcription so that you can heal from, from your workout or your injury. Also, when we use acoustic wave and we do the shock wave therapy, da, 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 we're basically via mechanotransduction uh, activating the integrins, the alpha beta integrins to come through and communicate with to the gene for transcription as well. So these are, you know, again, at the, I don't know, four millimeter level, because now we're at the cellular level. But if you go from that 40,000 to 400 to four foot, and now four millimeter view, this is what's happening from the outside to the inside. The internal environment, whether it's your genes that are in that nucleus that are gonna be transcribed, how methylate, well methylated you are, your microbiome and their genome, which is the, the, the microbiome genome, whether you're hydrated appropriately, whether you've got an acidic milieu, like if people have a CO2 that's 20, 21, 22, or if they have beta hydroxybutyrate, if they are completely ketotic and they're extensively ketotic over time and they've got an acidic milieu, or if they have lactate dehydrogenase, LDH, which we wanna measure, all of those things need to be understood in the setting of a patient's symptoms and then how we're gonna change it so that we can follow these numbers to be sure that we've changed toxicity with respect to glutathione and other things. We have to know the immune system, how healthy is the immune system. Just starting with the CBC with diff is critically important. You know, if you've got a, a left shift or, or you've got high monocytes, well, you've got to be addressing that. Inflammation, easy enough to see with many different modalities, homocysteine, CRP, uh, ESR, et cetera, oxidative stress. We can look at vitamin C, we can look at AE, 
Um, we can look at glutathione, et cetera, but really understanding oxidative stress. And then free fatty acid balance, FAB, knowing that you've got the appropriate fatty acids for that cell membrane for communication in, in the outer membrane of the cell into the mitochondria intracellularly, and that's where we have. So the internal environment is absolutely going to be reflective of the external environment. We are always reflecting our external environment. And that's really important to understand. So the way, again, we talk about lifestyle, stress, um, sleep, food, movement, vagal tone, um, XRT, radiation exposure, meds, if you take a lot of meds, vaccines, according to PTs, physical therapists that I work with, the number one injury they're seeing right now is what? frozen shoulder syndrome. Why? Because we're getting jabbed in the arm. So when people get a vaccine, I had a patient today, she got a vac she got three vaccines. After her first two vaccines, she had a frozen shoulder. Within, a, within less than a month, she went to see an ortho for her frozen shoulder. What did he do? He put in a, a corticosteroid injection. Well, how dumb is that? Then she got the booster. And what recently, two weeks ago, one week later, her frozen shoulder was even worse. So she went back and got another corticosteroid. I'm like, what's the point of the vaccine if you're gonna put steroids on top of it? These are really important things that we have to help people understand. The adjuvants within vaccines, within you know, other exposures, whether it's silicone breast implants or other endocrine disruptors, immune system disruptors, metals, aluminum, braces, implants, squalene, graphene, it's squalene. I think in this vaccine, it was graphene in um, the Gulf War vaccine for the Gulf War vets. So it's really important to understand how these adjuvants are affecting uh, immune system dysregulation. But again, just looking here, here's our plasma, here are our cells, we're measuring things in the blood because they should reflect what's going on in the interstitial fluid. A CO2 in the blood of 20 is not a good thing. Beta hydroxybutyrate off the charts or beta HMG methyl hydroxyglutarate is not a good thing because that means this whole tissue is acidic. And if this is acidic, guess what happens to the interstitial fascial tissue, extracellular matrix, extracellular matrix outside the cell, it's also acidic and cells don't like acidity. Guess what loves acidity? bugs, right? So you can get reactivation of the intracellular viral bugs that have been living in your system since you were 15 years old, 20 years old, whatever it is, right? Could be herpes one, could be herpes two, could be herpes three, which shingles, it could be herpes four, mono, whatever it is. So the plasma where we're measuring is a good way to assess, you know, in the variety of things in the plasma, what's going on in the interstitial fluid and the interstitial or the extracellular fluid is going to be also the fascial fluid, which is going to reflect intracellular fluid. So we are all a reflection, you know, it's like the pond in your backyard. I don't have a big enough backyard to have a pond, but it, it will be reflective of the soil and the soil within the pond. So we human beings are, are very much connected to the environment and we are very much a reflection of our environment. Again, you know, we can see these things are all, you know, connected, plasma, interstitial, extracellular fluid, intracellular fluid, lymph fluid, and other fluid, really important to understand. When we think of the interstitial extracellular fluid, the matrix that we saw in that gooey picture that looked like, you know, bubbles in the, in the, um, uh, um, tish, the dough, the kind of the pizza dough, the bread dough, here's the matrix. The matrix is made up of that ground substance, right? That ground substance is mostly fibers like collagen, elastin, relaxin, and different types of collagen fibers, collagen type one, two, three, four, you name it, and different balances depending upon whether it's the in that 40,000 foot view, whether it's down along the spine or whether it's going out up towards the latissimus dorsi in the back. There are going to be different densities of the fibers. Some types of collagen have the, have the strength of steel. Other types of collagens are, is, are very fragile. So very different types of collagen. And BPC can treat uh, type 1 collagen. We'll look at that. When we think of what this little group of cells that lives within this interstitial fluid or this extracellular matrix, they're made of fibroblasts. And mostly 
with a little bit of mast cells where we get that pop, you know, we get the histamine response, we get the release of fluid, the congestion, et cetera. Not a lot of flow going to happen there. The nerves, again, the nerves and the vessels are within that extracellular matrix, as we showed in the very beginning with that thoracal lumbar fascia, and then other cells, including stem cells, including those perinuclear stem cells. Again, here's the fascia. This is what it looks like. Um, and here's what it looks like on an electric mi electron micrograph, one tenth of an inch. So all within here, we've got the extracellular matrix and we also have some cells and we have nerves and here are the nerves. You can't see them in here, but when you look at that, you know, at a microscopic level, you can really see where the nerves are. And you know that from looking at gross pathology and, uh, and microscopic pathology, uh, we understand that we can see really what's going on in electron microscopic, microscopes as well. So the extracellular matrix governs all cellular functions and it contains a cocktail of proteins, signaling molecules, and a variety of chemicals that the cells ex exude. And then, you know, other that the cells within the within the fibroblast and the matrix exude. And the cells use the matrix to impart strength depending upon the type of collagen and shape, because it's, it's more dense, it's gonna be more shaped to the tissues like bone and brain. Um, it's been dismissed in the past as inert, but now it's proven that it's, it's critical for cell, cell behavior and it's the primary determinant of cell behavior. If we were to put muscle stem cells on a hard plastic plate, they won't grow. They will only renew and, and grow and differentiate into new muscle cells if they're on soft gels that are similar to the extracellular matrix. So it's really, really important. And we know that there are receptor proteins on these stem cells that are being signaled to so that they respond to their different binding partners depending upon where they're trying to be grown on. So the ECM guides the stem cells to repair damaged tissue, reform angiogenesis blood vessels that have been damaged by the uh, dirty extracellular matrix, and to alter the cellular responses even to chemotherapy or any medicinal therapy, any pharmaceutical therapy. It's the reservoir. If you were to do tissue delineation and put the peptide directly in the stem cell directly in that space, by doing fascial release, you would get a better result in a patient with pain or injury for sure, because it is the highway for communication between the cells within an organ system. Um, and so we're trying to engineer extracellular matrix, but that's a, that's we're not there yet. Um, again, reminding you that this extracellular matrix goes in and out, and that's where the things are flowing in the, in the mesenchymal stem cells sit. So your extracellular matrix can be alive and flowing and, or it can be dead and stagnant. So we have a choice and our external environment and our lifestyle will dictate and reflect our internal environment. So we can age and degenerate, or we can be really healthy and have an amazing lifestyle. And this is the Fascia Congress through the Osher Collaborative, which is a bunch of different universities, Karolinska, Harvard, Miami, U Miami, et cetera, that all are combined in order to amplify the collective of what everybody's learning with respect to the fascia. This is Carla Stecco, MD. She's a professor. Her father was also a physiatrist, her brother in New York. Um, they're Italian, but she recently coined a new cell, the fasciocyte, that in this particular cell, is the cell that releases hyaluronin or what we generally call hyaluronic acid that allows for that three-dimensional glide. The components of the fascial system are the fasciocytes and they're just along each fascial sublayer, you know, defining the boundary between the connective tissue and the fibrous tissue and they regulate the activity of the fascial cells um, to produce hyaluronin basically to allow for the movement. Fibroblasts generate collagen. So fasciocytes generate hyaluronin, fibroblasts are generating the collagen, the different types to provide the structural integrity, the support um, to the extracellular matrix for the tissue that it's forming. There's also fibrillin. 
and that increases elasticity. There's elastin and that allows for the recoil, right? So, the, so people with Marfan's may have more elastin, people with fib fibril more fibrillin may have airless Danlos. So looking at these, we can understand more diseases. There's collagen type one, which is the one that's very strong like steel. Collagen two, there's a variety of different types. And this is a peptide and a component of the joint cartilage and it's, it's tough as well. This is an electron microscope and I've done pathology. So basically this is, you know, demonstrating the muscle, the Z line, the myofibril and the, the connection between the extracellular matrix, the reticular lamina, and basically, you know, how there's flow in between. And you can see how, how fragile this is. I mean, this is the extracellular matrix over here and this is the myofibril. I mean, this is quite remarkable. We want to have the best ECM in order to have the best function of the myofibril. I mean, fashion hormones in terms of elasticity and recoil, in terms of fibrillin and elastin, you know, quite remarkable when we think about the uterus and pregnancy. Hormones are medicinal signaling therapies. Estrogen will regulate the genes that are involved in elastin so that we can have elasticity and we can grow. Um, and that will be very important. And progesterone will induce the synthesis of an appropriate collagen and as well as the elastic fiber, fiber proteins and will inhibit MMP in order so that the endometrial integrity can stay intact as it expands the uterus in order to <laughs> pregnancy. Testosterone and DHEA, the an anabolic um, pathway of steroids basically is critical and regulates the type of smooth muscle growth and the connective tissue protein that will allow for the hypertrophy of the uterus with growth as well. Relaxin, relaxin will, uh, if there's too much, there'll be pelvic joint laxity, but it will allow for the recoil. Um, and then one of the things that's really important for women, for sure, we can look at the amount, we can look at women during a monthly menstrual cycle and they will shift their levels of estrogen and progesterone. And as they shift their levels of estrogen and progesterone, they also will have different amounts of fibrillin and elastin. And they will be more likely to have an ACL tear or an injury at different points um, during their menstrual cycle. And, and that's quite you know, remarkable. So when we look here and we look at different levels of estrogen, when estrogen is appropriate and we're in tissue homeostasis, we have a balance between type one and type three collagen, that really, really strong collagen, this more elastic collagen, which is also strong, but more elastic. And we have a balance between elastin that allows us to open and uh, fibrillin that allows us to close. When the estrogen levels are low, so at the end of the month, the beginning of the month, we'll have decreased elasticity and a tighter tendon ligament, ACL, which can basically pop. But here as well, where when it's too mobile, we can also pop it. So really balance is pretty important. And we this has been shown in studies to be um, related. And this is a book on fascia function, medical applications. I've written a chapter in there on the hormones and um, Carla Stecco's in there and, and a bunch of different uh, authors. Um, regionology with medicinal signaling therapies. We want to take this seed in the soil, the extracellular matrix. If you imagine back to the embryo and you imagine that you've got one of those little mesenchymal stem cells there and you want to take that mesenchymal stem cell, bathe it in the best extracellular matrix that you can, and then you're going to have it grow and become the tissue that you need it to become and have it be healthy tissue. So that's the way to, so we talked about sleep. Hydration is more important than we realize. Immune dysregulation, diet movement, the omega-3 for that that um, connection, as we saw in the electron micrograph before the extracellular matrix and the myofibril, phosphatidylcholine, a variety of collagen with vitamin C, et cetera, balancing the hormones critically important, uh, PRP, which has many growth factors, again, unfortunately not characterized. We could use exosomes or cytosomes, they're better characterized. We can use peptides like BPC, AOD with HA, 
Um, we can use thymosin beta-4, depending upon what the problem is and what the inflammatory dysregulation is, shockwave acoustic percussion, structural integration therapy, acupuncture, needling, you know, all of these things, whatever you feel you're good at, we want to take as many modalities that we can use together for, and, and work the parts to create the whole, whether it's the athlete or the happy human and happy, happy, healthy, you know what peptides are. We've been down this path before. I won't go into peptides. I use a lot of AOD with HA basically because it will burn fat and fat is what will be involved in muscle atrophy or joint or organ atrophy. If there's an injury, it builds cartilage and muscle. It improves bone strength and it doesn't go down that insulin-like growth um, it doesn't go on the IGF-1 pathway that basically can be pro-diabetic. So AOD is fantastic. It's been relatively FDA approved in creams and other ways. AOD with HA is a little bit more challenging to get. I've kept my reserve. And so basically into joints generally, I will always put a little bit of AOD with HA along with PRP, along with doing acoustic wave therapy, along with BPC or TB4, depending upon what the injury is. This is epimorelin, CJC EPA. This is growth hormone releasing peptide. And when you look at EPA and you see it works on the immune system, changes, reverses age associated involution of the thymus gland. So it, it helps to re-regulate and modulate homeostatic immune system. It works on the spleen in terms of the immune system, the bone in terms of the immune system, T cells, macrophages, reducing those uh, inflammatory M1 components, dendritic cells, and basically will allow for you know cell inflammatory reduction and healing. So I love CJC EPA as an adjunct to use after uh, you know treating an injury. This is about the. Um, acoustic wave, the shock wave therapy, the miracle wave. You've heard a lot about this from Gerhard, you know, basically how we can treat. And I think in Germany, they've got it right. You know, they're very specialized in terms of how they use all of the different tips that are on the acoustic wave machine, et cetera. I am not going to go into, so I'm going to speed by these. I'm not going to go into the, well, I think these are really good because when we use the acoustic wave, the shock wave, we're putting it here on the skin. And when we're thinking about either radial wave penetration, radial, which would be more wide or focused, we're basically going into the depth of a tissue. And it's kind of like photobiomodulation, which we know is really good. You can use red light at the same time. So you're basically getting into effect. Here's the blood. We know that the blood and the interstitial, interstitial fluid are reflective of each other. So we're opening up flow and that tissue in order for healing to happen. When we've got mechanotransduction, we're getting activation of better genes than the phenotype of sitting there with an injury in this particular space where the ECM will be kind of dirty. And, you know, if we're, we've got injured tissue, we're going to not have you know, great angiogenesis or blood vessel flow. And within PRP, exosomes, you name it, we want VEGF in order to vascular endothelial growth factor in order to promote angiogenesis for healing. I think that's really, really important. Um, so I'm going to go to a few. There's lots and lots of studies on acoustic wave. Uh, you don't use it with an active tumor. You don't try to disrupt a tumor. You don't use it in pregnancy or if somebody's had, you know, corticosteroids um, or anabolic steroids. So that's really important. And I, I had a patient who was supposed to come in today who has a young guy with a clot in his leg. I'm not going to do acoustic wave on him with a clot in his leg, even though he's been on uh, warfarin. I'm not using this. So no coagulation disorder, no warfarin, no thromboses or clots. Uh, and no one, not near the heart pacemaker. It's very cost-effective treatment. It's a little time consuming, but it has proven pain relief, natural regeneration proving, proliferation and cell re renewal of the MSCs. Very, very good for plantar fasciitis, tendinopathies, very, very good. Um, and I use it in all of these. And for an athlete for accelerated healing, you know, the US, the Olympic team has used this in the Atlanta games. And then also um, all of the different teams here, I know in Boston have this. So this is a 25 year old man, 
patient in our practice. He, we're working on some other problems. You know, he was trying to be outside and move. He was kind of running, kicking a soccer ball, not hard, not even playing in a game. His right hamstring was injured. He called me right away on a weekend. You know, I have a lot of pain. I need your help. He was just in complete distress. By the time he came to us during the early part of the week, he presented and said he couldn't run. It was really uncomfortable to walk. He couldn't go outside. He's only 25. Um, so basically, we um, did two treatments at 20 minutes each, uh, one per week for two weeks, and he was completely healed. And that was a big deal in terms of he's got mold. And that was a big deal in terms of the other things that we've been working on um, in the last three to four months when I first met him. And there's a video here that I don't need to play that tells you that he feels good. This is a 26 year old male uh, lives in California. Uh, he's an avid athlete. He really loves to ski here in in the Northeast. Um, he came in with a sustained injury to a shoulder and his right knee. And basically he's been doing He's been in, injured for several years. He's been doing physical therapy. He's been stretching. He's a pretty disciplined kid, very, really smart kid. Um, and he's, he can exercise, but he doesn't have full strength. And he's really worried about going out and skiing. So he's another one that um, actually I will do a second injection with him in Vegas, inject his shoulder with PRP, peptides, and exosomes, and inject his knee a second time with PRP. He has a right MCL with, it's not fully strengthened as well, still a little bit sore. So I'll inject that as well. But he, um, you know, he's done, he's done fairly well. I think two will, will complete it. So, you know, essentially, I'll show you in another case study what I've done with him, inject his, his knee and his shoulder, and he's doing well. This is a 28 year old woman again coming to healing and whenever somebody's losing their hair and they're 28 years old, there's definitely gonna to have to be some problem in the immune system and some pro problem in the interstitial fluid. So she, a month and a half before her wedding, she complained of thinning hair and have to ask if we could do anything about it. So we microneedled one time with PRP and injected it and we have some hair peptides and she was extremely happy with the growth. This is at her, you know, just before her wedding. So we only did one treatment and this is a, a great, you know, photo. Um, this is a 35 year old, this is an old case. She's a female with Crohn's. She had an exacerbation five years ago with Crohn's. She was so, so sick, lost about 50 pounds. She's 5'9", weighed about 102 pounds, ended up in the hospital. She was in the hospital for a long time on steroids um, on, with a PIC line on IV antibiotics, IV steroids, basically left the hospital, came directly to my office. She was already a, a patient and we did peptides. She's alternated BPC, oral sub-Q, um, also with some high-dose probiotics. She's done TA1, TB4. But just alone with the BPC and some IV nutrients, she literally had the PIC line taken out 10 days post-discharge. Now she did have IV steroids, so that did help a little bit, but she never got sick again. Now we know that BPC you know, can stimulate NGF1A, the binding protein, and can help to heal the soft tissue. The, again, the nerve growth binding protein, it can stimulate the expression of early growth response. So she'll get growth of the tissue and that's wonderful. And, you know, will he, will help in the healing. She's a Crohn's patient so that her inflammation is gone away. And she used it both in both mechanisms. I call it internally through sub Q and externally with oral because it's in the external part of the colon. And we know that BPC can help in inflammation, colitis and ischemia and reperfusion in animals. This was her stool study, um, you know, around the time she went in the hospital, she had blood in her stool, her calprotectin was off the charts. She had lactoferrin or white blood cells. Eosinophil protein X, a lot of secretory IgA, no butyrate to soothe the gut, you know, pretty decent microbiome, not terrible. Um, she had a lot of inflammatory in 2016 right here, fibrinogen of 511, CRP at eight, again, dexamethasone and many of these things, but she never has had an exacerbation between the fall of 2016, summer fall of 2016, and 2021 here, the winter. And her, at that point in time, her inflammatory markers improved dramatically and they've stayed improved. 
Um, again, looking here, her fatty acid balance, this is the fatty acid balance on the Boston heart. This is another exceptional test to let us know, you know, how are we doing with respect to the balance between thick, thick fats, saturated fats, trans fats, monounsaturated fats, and liquid fats like omega-3s and omega-6s, particularly, you know, in this ratio, DGLA is in between here and understanding what the omega-6-3 ratio is in the AAEPA ratio and optimizing those by mostly, not for this patient as much, she doesn't have much trans fat, she's very, very thin, very conscious of her food, not much saturated fat, monounsaturated, she could use a little bit more. And certainly here we can see this should be about five and she's five here. Um, we definitely wanna bring up her uh, omega-3s and the omega-3 ratio. So we work on those things. She had a big nutrient need. This was in 2018, bigger in 2016, getting a little bit better, but everybody always has a need. So she basically did IV nutrients regularly post-discharge, BPC regularly, cycling of TB420 with TA1, one day of TB4, one day of TA1, when she thought she might be nearing an, an, an inflammatory exacerbation. And she has not had anything acute with any need for any treatment from a conventional GI doc in five years based on her good work and her diligence on doing these things. This, should I keep going? Are you guys sending me texts to stop or anything like that? Um, you can use keep BPC going. oil and sub at the same time. Should I keep going? It's almost keep done. Keep going. No, okay. no, you're, we're good. So this is a, a patient who is a 61 year old female. She's a chef. She works you know, really, really um, diligently. She's the only thin chef I know. She's right from Italy. She's not one of those overweight chefs. Um, the big issue I saw her for, for, for was neck pain and back pain. So the neck pain, she's really hunched over. She definitely has dowager's hump and her neck is from, you know, moving the dough, making the pasta, making the pizza in her restaurant for 35 years working her you know, fingers through the bone, basically, I mean, you can imagine how much neck pain she can have and hand pain. Um, but another issue she had was she had two dental titanium implants bilaterally, so total of four. And what happened when she, after she got those in, in 2015, around 2017, 2018, she started to lose the bone and the implants were very fragile and the, dentist, the orth, oral surgeon didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do either, but she begged me to talk to him. He's very well known. He's foreign. Um, I can't remember who's for, but he knew about a lot of really regenerative modalities. He didn't really know about exosomes, stem cells, or peptides. And I was trying to talk to him about, well, let's just try it. I mean, I don't know. It could work. He, it turned out that he ultimately spoke to me. It took probably a year and a half to get him to talk to me. The patient insisted, and it turned out that he was friends. His wife was like really good friends with my college roommate. So he finally spoke to me. He let me come to his office in, in 2019. And he let me um, inject in the mouth bilaterally uh, some exosomes and peptides. And ultimately we did seven sessions, you know, basically more on the right because it was a little bit, but usually doing both sides, more on the, the side that was more broken down. And after the first heat scan and then the second scan of looking at what the change was, he was blown away. He wanted to be my best friend. Can, we can change the world. We can do this. I can't believe it. I never know what's going to happen. So, you know, being creative with these things, if you've got the right patient um, is really good. The severe neck pain continued as we, you know, basically did the, let's talk about the oral implant. And she basically has done sub-Q BPC combined with oral because it's expensive and injecting into the, basically into the, the gums, the gum tissue around each of the implants. I mean, we can put in very micro, it's like microdose, and we can put a little bit with a sub-Q needle, 30, 30 gauge sub-Q needle, we can do 30 injections, just injecting this right in the tissue. It's very sore when you're done for about two or three days, but very bearable. So she's had this done twice in 19, twice in 20, three times in 21. And I think she basically bases it on 
how her mouth feels. She knows when she's when her hormone therapy, um, she she uses a patch and she knows when it's you know, uh, petering out because she feels more pain. It's a medicinal signaling therapy. She also knows when she needs BPC because she feels it in her mouth. So, and she generally, you know, where her mouth is really healing. And we know that BPC promotes type one collagen uh, re regeneration, which is basically tendons, ligaments, bone, dentin, dermis of the skin. And this is basically a part of what we're using you know, when we're putting it in her gum tissue. Um, this is her having her, uh, the shockwave therapy, the acoustic wave therapy. You know, she tries to come regularly three times a week because without this, it's impossible for her to be without pain in her neck bilaterally, mostly around here and then going down her arms. But here's a video and I'm not gonna play it again, her telling saying that, you know, after each therapy session, she gets better and cumulative better over time. Again, she's already got dysfunction and structural problems. She needs some serious structural integration therapy as well. And these are just 20 minute segments. So I'm not going to play the video. So let's just go. I might have two more cases. This is my second to last. This is a 61 year old male and he came in. I, he's a doctor. He came in, you know, somebody knew me, don't, he, just, he didn't know if he could talk to me. It's been about two years. His friend had told me another doctor that he was coming in. Finally, he came in. He didn't really want to talk. He just said he had erectile dysfunction. He had some hip pain. He wasn't sure how they were related. Um, and he's always in twisted positions with his uh, medicine job. Um, and the hip pain had been getting worse for three years. He hadn't been sleeping well. He was married and he said he didn't have intimate relations for 11 years. And now he had a new partner and he wasn't sure, you know, he was really concerned about the erectile dysfunction. He was taking a lot of SARMs. He was getting them from friends at the gym. I mean, this, he had been doing these things for a very long time. And even from the internet, he couldn't remember what the SARMs were. He was trying to, ah, da, 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 da. I figured I'd just measure and see what things look like. He was taking gabapentin for his low back pain, wasn't really helping. And for sleep, he was taking some ibuprofen, not really helping, Lunesta for sleep. And then these SARMs that he was getting from his friend, who was also telling him from the gym how to use them. And he had been doing this for quite some time. At any rate, for his right hip pain, we did several things. I did a, a one cc injection of TB4, that helped. I did BPC 30 units, he took that home and he finished a bottle of it. We also have BPC, um, Michael, mm, I gave you his name, Michael, um, what's his name? Michael Antonelli, who bought the tailor-made version of the nutrient part of TaylorMade. He makes a BPC topical, which is great. He used that. He used a, a month's supply in about a week, um, but he felt like that helped. He thought that, you know, Cialis, whenever he took that, really in, impaired his erections, which is kind of counterintuitive and made his back pain worse. He found a, an article in a dental journal telling me how true that was. Um, he was, he's very funny. And at any rate, when we relieved his TFL from that slide I showed you to, before, the tensor fascia lot of the IT band and the muscle, the gluteus maximus, he could walk more easily. Um, and he felt like his erections were better, but obviously not enough. So we did the typical gains wave shock wave treatment to the penis times three. We did PRP. Actually, I did an exosome first injection after the third one. And then four weeks after the exosome injection, he felt like he got, you know, good function. So we used BPC because we know the pain in the back down here in his hip and his right hip that he thought was affecting his erectile function is decreasing flow of inflammatory mediators, B4, B2, myeloperoxidase, et cetera, not just in the serum, but really in the interstitial fluid. Um, and so that helped a little bit along with the TB4, which is why I chose thymus and beta-4 as well. Here's his blood work that came by at his first blood check. He couldn't remember what he took when, you know, a microcytic, but, um, you know, dense polycythemic crit, uh, not bad in my opinion, 51.7 is fine, but he's very, very microcytic. So he's been doing some things for quite some time. Here we can see elevated LFTs, 
a low elk foss, not surprising. His iron is up. Again, I'm just getting to know this guy. I can't remember if he's had labs before. A very low IGF-1, a normal CRP. LFTs could be from the SARMs he's been using, could be from creatine that he's taking. You know, he just was very sketchy about everything. He's continuing to come because I'm patient around understanding what he's doing. Here's his testosterone. And he thought his testosterone was going to be low. So he had a 546, but clearly he's jacking his testosterone with the SARMs. He's got a free of 17. He's got lots of uh, percent free. His SHBG is low. Obviously, he's releasing a lot of this total testosterone. Sorry about that. Sorry. Don't want to make you dizzy. We can tell by his luteinizing hormone that he's taking testosterone exogenously and his estrogens are high as well. He's got a pretty good DHEA sulfate, um, pretty good estradiol, could be a little bit lower, a little slightly high estrogen. So he's obviously blocking as well this testosterone, testosterone from going into uh, estrogens. Here's his fatty acid balance, basically demonstrating that he has very poor, you know, omega-3 fatty acids in relation to his trans fats, his saturated fats. He's got low arachidonic acid as well. I mean, some of these, some of these athletes will take arachidonic acid. So the, the people who are like, who is the governor of California? What's his name? He wrote the book on some of this stuff. Um, I'll be back. Schwarzenegger. So they often can take arachidonic acid. So you can get a sense of um, what they're taking based on looking at their labs. This is taking it again. He, you know, wanted me to take over his hormones, but he didn't really want to give up control. He still has his friend at the gym. So I still don't really know what he's doing, you know, in terms of, um, in terms of what he's taking. Here is CO2 is 28. He's not ketotic. Um, his creatinine and his EGFR are quite low. I often see this in bodybuilders. This is really key to be looking at. They often box their kidneys. And I've given quite a few bodybuilders actually stem cells um, and particular other treatments for to heal their kidneys when their EGFRs are down below 40. Ideally, we can bring them up back to 60, but the sooner we can get them to regulate um, to regulate as they're, ele they're, they're getting hepatitis, they're also getting uh, reduced kidney function. And it's really important to follow these things. Here is testosterone level is 3000, which is not anything that, that I would, you know, generally be recommending, but I'm starting in the dark with this, this gentleman, this doctor, and also here's his DHT. And he's very concerned about not being big and bulky and very concerned about being long and live and lean. So it's all part of the body dysmorphic syndrome, but clearly on that, we gave him some B12 after we saw him the first time to bring it up from 500. He's a 1471, no big deal. He's got a really good catabolic anabolic balance here in this, and his estrogens are very high. So he's clearly done quite a bit of testosterone in the interval between in the two month interval and, and in what we're checking here. This is the shim score. I'm sure you've all seen that. I don't have to review that. It will be in the slide deck that I will share with you after, um, after uh, A4M. And so we did, you know, he had moderate to severe ED based on the shim score initially, slightly improved. Um, at the second, he got the P shot. He was a little bit higher. This was where he felt like post the P, the, not the, it's, it was actually exosomes. Um, this is where he felt like he was finding his sweet spot. Sweet spot. And then um, he basically started another group of ESWT shockwaves. And then I did give him a PRP injection. The reason I gave him a PRP injection, I didn't do a very good job like quizzing him. He talked a lot and kind of kept, you know, getting away from the topics. Um, and he, he wanted, he felt like he couldn't stay erect. He felt like he was losing the, the fullness of the penis during intercourse. So I said, okay, we'll take PRP as opposed to an exosome. <laughs> and we filled the penis. So I put like 12 cc's of PRP, hang on, you know, we're looking for angiogenesis and basically I'm shock waving in six spots. But what I did with the PRP was I basically injected, you know, like six, 
six cc's, six cc's, six cc's, six cc's, and then shaped shaped the the little opening here, and he was so happy, and he felt also very good after that. But we know that when we do PRP, it stays temporarily and then it does its job. And six to eight weeks, maybe 10 weeks later, then we know whether or not we're going to get any effect of it. Um, and so, you know, basically he was happy for about 10 days and then it shrunk back down. And when I further questioned him, this is how we did it. We put, we used a 30 cc syringe, one c, a 30 cc needle, a one cc syringe and basic actually a five cc syringe and basically did five cc's took five cc's then injected a little bit more and filled the penis and then basically shaped this and i'm sure you've all probably done that in the past but it looked amazing i do have to say and he was really happy so at least he could have a little bit of you know a sense a little bit of appreciation of what you know can happen with the prp i know that gains you know richard gains fills with with uh, filler I'm not a big filler person. I'd rather use a little bit of PRP and exosome, get the angiogenesis, let him know that, you know, we can get a little bit more fullness with this PRP. But ultimately what he was into both sides of the penis, what he was wanting was, so he's 61, he hadn't had intercourse. He's got all of these SARMs that he's taken messing up his whole HPA axis. And he said, well, I, he said, well, to be honest, doc, what I really want is I want to have intercourse every night when I go to bed and every morning when I wake up. And I basically had to have a reality conversation with him that at 61, if he could get that, that I'd put him in the book of records. Maybe some of you guys can tell me differently, but that was, you know, I didn't know that that was his expectation. I said, well, if you can increase the refractory period, I bet you'll have a better shim score. So maybe if you could have, you know, play and have foreplay and not, and have intercourse at 48 hour intervals, you'd have more refractory period. And I bet you'd be able to stay harder, get harder and stay harder longer. And I saw him today and he basically said that that was true um, with you know, in increasing the refractory period of days as opposed to 12 hours that he was doing better. Um, so that's him just giving you a sense of how we use some of these things. This is a 58 year old woman. I just met her in March. She had had a surgery, she's 58. They did a surgery removing her uterus, God knows why, um, because she had an abnormal pap smear, but the uterus was fine on pathology. But they did that in November of 2020, so six months earlier or five months earlier. Subsequent to um, the surgery, she then got COVID. Um, and was very sick, didn't get any treatment, never got a vaccine after that, but just really never recovered. So she had been overweight a little bit before surgery, but then really postoperatively had extreme weight loss resistance. Her joints were killing her. She was feeling fatigued. She had some dental issues in the interim between November and March as well, which again is soft tissue. She was having hot flashes. She was hypo, newly hypothyroid um, being treated and had a history of estrogen dominance with some fibroids. And her goals were to get off the weight, improve the pain in the, in the joints, which was really bothering her and she couldn't move and the inflammation. So that's her story. We did a bunch of testing and we, our goal was to, you know, are there endocrine disruptors, correct any insulin resistance, balance her hormones, and identify and reduce inflammatory. So she gained a lot of weight. She did prolon times three. She lost weight, then it came back. Before I saw her, we did fentramine. She didn't like that at all. Um, she felt tingly, agitated, heart racing. She was on an anti-inflammatory diet. We were considering some HDCG. She was on um, levothyroxine or T4. So here's the, her recent... Um, COVID-2, this is vibrant, where we're basically looking to see what kind of antibodies. She has a lot of antibodies presently, six, actually 10 months later, to spike one, spike two, and receptor binding domain. These three are positive if it's just vaccine, but nuclear protein is positive if you've been infected. Um, so she had natural immunity, which is really quite good at this point in time, you know, eight months later, uh, and probably is still having some inflammatory uh, an inflammatory milieu, more uh, polarized towards TH2 than TH1, 
uh, at this point in time, you know, probably benefiting from um, thymus and beta-4. Here are Boston Heart COVID labs showing us that she has a ton of spike to protein, and here she has a you know, pretty good amount of neutralizing serum, even though she's not been vaccinated. So these, I do a lot of COVID testing just to kind of see, try to understand what the hell all this misinformation is about because it's the data is pretty horrific. I'm not really sure that this is helping me, but I'm trying. I thought, you know, these are again, interesting tests. She, the reason I brought up that she had some gun tissue issues because I often see an increased MPO and an increased fibrinogen along with an increased CRP that she had at a different place that was elevated and she has an elevated ESR um, when there's mouth inflammation. But again, inflammation from COVID could do this. We often think it's just IL-6, but I've seen IL-6 elevated in non-COVID patients for other reasons and not necessarily in COVID. Um, of course, I don't take care of hospitalized patients, so I'm all patient. This is a woman who has, um, again, we're thinking about weight loss, right? She wants to lose a good 30 or 40 pounds and needs to, and she needs to reduce the infl inflammatory chemicals in order for her joints to even feel better. Her sugar was only 104. Her A1C, I believe, was 5.2. It was definitely completely within normal, just looking at those two numbers. But 84 is not normal fasting. What's normal fasting is, I'm sorry, 104 is not normal. 84 is normal. And for every point over 84, you have a very high risk for becoming, uh, it's an, I think it's like an increase of 10 or 20% of becoming diabetic. We can see her insulin level. We can see her adiponectin level. And we know adiponectin is the first thing to reduce. They've changed their range here, 11 uh, and 13. 13 is also low. So she's right on the cusp. 20 is a good adiponectin level. And so we know that with a lower adiponectin that she's gonna to trend towards insulin resistance, putting out more insulin, the sugar should be 84. And when we measure through their testing, they measure through their algorithm, the insulin resistance score. We want low insulin resistance under one. We want high sensitivity over 50. And we can see that she's not one, she's five. She's not over 50, she's 20. So she has very, she has a very inflamed uh, beta cell pancreatic function. Here's her A1C, slightly elevated homocysteine. You know, I would have expected her with her inflammatory state to have a high IGF-1, but she had a low IGF-1. So normal, what's normal? 175, 180, looking at patterns. I would have expected her to be in the 200s and she's not. Here's her lactate dehydrogenase. Again, there's, there's likely some part of the microbiome or some microbial component that's producing lactate um, that she's having a hard time clearing that's also affecting her pH. Her triglycerides are low. She doesn't have metabolic syndrome, but she clearly has, um, but she clearly has um, insulin resistance and she's trending towards type, uh, type two diabetes. And I hope that the diagram is here. Um, Here's her Cyrex looking, does she have increased intestinal permeability? And she's got basically uh, paracellular and transcellular uh, leakiness. So increased intestinal permeability. And this is our, whoops. So our Cyrex, you know, basically is looking at the um, paracellular between the cells that's leaky. And here's her transcellular right across the cell that's leaky. So she's got LPS that's going into the system that could produce lactate dehydrogenase and she's got, you know, a gluten zonulin. Um, I don't know why that's there. This is her, uh, this is the only real significant thing on her GI where she has a metabolic imbalance. She doesn't have um, increased fiber. She has very low fiber. She doesn't have butyrate in her gut. Also with the leakiness, um, she has methylation issues, obviously likely genetic. She's got mitochondrial dysfunction, some toxic exposure, um, and an she needs omega-3. So these are just some cursory things. We can see that she is ketogenic. 
So in addition to LDH, she's using fats excessively making beta hydroxybutyric acid or ketones. And those are going to make her very inflamed and very painful. So inflammatory mediators and beta hydroxybutyric acid ketone will produce dramatic inflammation and pain. And then when we look at the cleanup through the citric acid cycle or the mitochondria, we can see that she's not very good at cleanup because she basically gets, throws a wrench in at the different components of the cycle where she doesn't keep going and she hits a wall in terms of the clearing uh, and ATP production to get rid of toxicity and even put good things in, into her system. So these are just some key components. This is looking again at that insulin resistance and low sensitivity. And many people I have might be around here. A few people are over here on the beta cell function risk index. And, and I think I've, I was on their, you know, their initial studies looking at doing this, and I'm glad that they added it because this is a woman who has resistance to weight loss. Now she needs hormonal balancing as well with estrogen progesterone. She needs some thyroid T4, T3 balancing, but we definitely have to improve the sensitivity, sensitivity of her insulin at the receptor, really, really important. And we have to recognize that her beta cell function is not optimal obviously losing weight, exercising and movement, but that's why she's here, maybe using metformin, which she's very resistant to. So maybe using other modalities, you know, whether it's MOTC or whatever else we choose to use, um, HCG, who knows? I know they're all off the market. I have a little bit left, so I might use those on her. We're having her balance her carbs and regulate to regulate her insulin. I have people go on 100 grams of carb or less a day, 30 to 35 per meal. Um, and that's really important three times a day because they have no idea, you know, how many, how many carbs that they're eating day in and day out. Look at endocrine and exocrine uh, disruptors, optimize her IGF-1 to improve insulin sensitivity with CJC and EPA, and we're working towards these things. Address that ESR, CRP. She doesn't have, she's been to rheumatology. She doesn't have any rheumatoid factor, ANA, et cetera. So it's really just these inflammatory mediators post-surgery, post-operatively, and also post-COVID. Um, she's got a lot of still inflammatory mediators. Um, repolarize the immune system, increase the mitochondrial metabolic activity. And really this is, these are our goals. We gave her some berberine because she didn't want to do metformin. We're starting low and slow. She's going to do some intermittent fasting. We've got some photodynamic food therapy, curcumin, antioxidants, remove inflammatory foods, limiting the carbs. She's had glutathione in the practice in the beginning. She didn't do well with Ventramine. We've given her some BPC, some TB4, um, and talked about HCG, but we tried some AOD, some HCG. She didn't really notice differences. Um, then this week she presented and she said, I can't even bend my right knee. So she had her leg, her right leg in full extension and she pushed it out to the side in full extension to sit down. And she was in excruciating pain. She couldn't sit on the toilet. It was very difficult. She got a big, a high toilet seat. And I said, look, let's just do some shockwave therapy today, see what we got. She bent her knee to 90 degrees after the shockwave therapy. We ordered an MRI and we're going to consider some knee injections based on the MRI. And here she is with her knee bent at 90 degrees, which is, you know, quite remarkable just after one 20 minute shockwave nice. therapy. You don't have to get this, but get so I am not Oh, I have one more. Um, do you want me to keep going or stop? It's all the same. I'll show you. This is a D1 athlete who basically had serious right knee pain. He was at a large school on the West Coast. He had some post-exercise effusion. He was on a scholarship at a big West Coast school for uh, uh, one of the track and field. And he was also um, going for the military. And so he wanted to be able to exercise full range of motion, no pain. He couldn't squat. squat. He couldn't run you know, without any of these issues. So for him in March of 2018, his first surgery, he had, for, he had a surgery for a meniscal tear. And then in October, 2018, they did scraping for of scar tissue. When he was injured in February of 2019, a surgeon wanted to do a out in 
uh, the state he was in on the West Coast perform a cadaveric tissue transplant. I said, why not just do some exosome stem cells, peptides into the knee? I can, I didn't want to do it, um, but his mom insisted, she's a doc, she knew me and she insisted that he come. So basically he agreed. I thought he should go to somebody else out on the West Coast, but she agreed. he agreed to come. Um, he had been injected by another peptide doctor, a fellow of mine, prior to around this 2018 time, and it was extremely painful. So he was very nervous about pain. I never had people have pain when I inject them, so I didn't worry about it. I just didn't want to, I wanted a big result if I was going to do it, and that I couldn't feel confident about. So I looked, and he had a really large piece of his um uh, quad missing. And that's where he was going to do the cadaveric transplant. And I'm like, I can't imagine how we're going to treat this. But in any way, we put MSCs in, um, into his knee, along with peptides. And, you know, basically, I palpate the knee and put the injections in. Um, I use one syringe, and then I basically take off the needle and put the AODHA in, the PRP in, in separate syringes. It's not painful at all. He didn't experience one bit of pain. So um, we did cytokine-rich plasma. We basically uh, concentrated it and took out the white blood cells. Um, and we did BPC and AOD with HA. And I saw him six months later, remember AOD with HA. Remember here's B A, I'm sorry, that was BPC. Here's AOD with HA and showing, you know, using this intraarticularly, um, this is with or without hyaluronic acid and you're gonna get a softening of the erosion and you're gonna get full healing, which is quite remarkable. Um, and this is six month post injection. And, you know, basically I did an interview with him, you know, basically I don't want to go through it. It's eight minutes, but he is ecstatic. So he can squat, he can run five minute miles. We did one more injection at, this was in August where I saw him, no injections. We did one more in December of the same year. And it's now two years later and he's functioning fantastically. Um, maintained his scholarship, both in ROTC and uh, also in um, the track and field, and he's very, very happy. So that's it. I'm sorry it was so long. I can basically take any questions. Okay, let me look in this. Uh, vendors, um, thank you all for being here. Um, what peptides do I use to stimulate collagen? Mostly BPC. Um, with thymus and beta-4, I'm, I'm kind of modulating the immune system that may be misdirecting fibrosis with collagen, with different types of collagen. So I use three predominantly. If I think there's active inflammation, I will use TB4. If I think that there's, you know, very low-grade chronic inflammation and I want to heal the fibrosis, I'll use BPC, PRP, CRP. And if I want to rebuild, I might use AOD with HA. Um, and then the other thing is A2M. So you might all know about A2M, alpha-2 microglobulin, that basically you can do the FACT test in DJD, F-A-C-T. You can take a sample of any fluid. Many times they're dry. You can send that to the lab and you can you know, basically tell whether or not a DJD or one of the college athletes who may be injured would benefit from A2M. No harm, no foul. Even if you put it in, you're not going to harm them. So a A2M is very similar to CRP. Um, so I've done that as well. That is the work of um, uh, Dr. What's his name? He's the Italian doctor in Florida. Where do all the golfers go? It begins with a P. Anyway, he's he's really good. Scuderi, Gaetano Scuderi is the doctor, um, you know, basically who has done tons of research on A2M. Very easy to do. And he's really a great uh, ortho that cares about Gaetano Scuderi um, down in Jupiter. He's in Jupiter, Florida. So that's what I'll use for that. Um, can you use sub, sub Q peptides in IV form? I do. I gave somebody TA1 through the line. He was getting an IV vitamin C today, another athlete from TB12. 
Um, he was getting IV vitamin C because he felt kind of run down. I gave him both TA1 and TB4 at separate intervals through the line of the IV. Um, you can use sub-Q and oral because obviously oral is outside the body and sub-Q is getting into the tissue. So very, very different. Um, yeah. And do I use ultrasound guidance for penis? Never. It's never really a problem. Um, ultrasound, I just basically numb the, the, the perineal nerves uh, just above the, the base of the penis, like in the perineum. I'm, I numb on both sides, kind of at 11 a.m. and 1 p.m., put a little bit of lidocaine in there. Not much. They never feel it. I basically will sound wave the penis in six locations, the bilateral sides of the of the penis um, underneath the the testes on both sides there. That's four sides. And then I do the right and the left in terms of around the area where I'm numbing. Um, and whatever they can tolerate it with the settings of the acoustic wave I use. And then I, I've already gotten my PRP or I already have, I'm um, uh, um, taking my exosomes and melting them. And then I'm preparing those. Exosomes are only going to be one CC. You could use two CCs, but one CC typically, and you might put a, a quarter, a quarter, that's proximal to the base of the penis, distal to the base of the penis, a quarter, a quarter on one side, and then a quarter, a quarter on the other, and you've used a whole CC, or you could do a little bit more half and half. Um, depends on what the patient's budget is. And um, and uh, and then it takes, you know, usually between the time you inject and four weeks, along with using Cialis daily, five milligrams daily minimum, um, and along with stimulation, whether it's self-stimulation or intimate stimulation every day, using that, um, that's what I do. Uh, and then if I put PRP and I can use a lot more and I can fill it and it can look really nice and people can be really excited about how thick the penis looks. I don't like to use anastrozole for high estrogen because it's just like using um, estrogen reducers in you know, it can, it can create the aromatase induced, the aromatase induced um, pain syndrome. So I don't love using an astrozole in anybody, particularly in men, because that could be one of the causes of osteopenia and osteoporosis. The biggest issue with an astrozole for men with high E is, um, um, is bone loss. So I, I think that's really important. And the other thing that I don't know if any of you have used this new thing that's on the market in a testo, it's a uh, intranasal testosterone. And I've looked at the data on it. I'm going to start using it on the wounded warriors that are the young guys, because it's not supposed to, you know, impact your LH, FSH and your testosterone level. So I'll start using that a little bit more. Um, yeah, so that's basically, I'm so sorry that this is so, uh, so long. Well, Dr. Halas is not here, so we, we're, we're getting off real easily. <laughs> Thank really God, early. yeah. Thank God. I didn't hear methylene blue mentioned once. <laughs> mm -hmm. I didn't hear methylene, methylene blue. blue. Yeah, blue. methylene blue, that's a whole different topic. We didn't talk about that. Yeah, I do use a lot of methylene blue, but not in these cases. Yeah. Um, so in place of an astrazole, what, would you, what do you use? Well, you know, I think that the tricky thing is to find the right way to, this is really interesting, to find the right way to get the best optimal testosterone level and anabolic level that you can get for these patients without increasing the estrogen. So it, I try to modulate the SHBG, right? So that you can mm -hmm. increase the sex hormone binding globulin and you can bind a little bit more of the testosterone. I don't try to get my testosterone levels um, above 800, my total. And then my free, I'm looking for levels that are somewhere around, you know, 10, 12, 15, depending upon what the patient will feel. These young guys that are wounded warriors, I'm seeing very low T levels, like even a total of 50. Um, and they are having gynecomastia surgery that they're paying cash for multiple times. So you, these guys who have a total testosterone level of 50, it's not the estrogen level because those are low as well that's causing this breast tissue gynecomastia. So there's a lot we need to understand about 
um, the relationship between T and E, T replacement, microdosing testosterone could be an option, right? Sub, sub Q, it's a little harder to release, but you could try that. So there's a lot of ways to try these things. So I just looked it up on GoodRx, and a testo is one hundred ninety three dollars a month. What is um, the testo? Oh, testo. Really? Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, they're all of these drugs. That's actually pretty good. Uh, um, the the once every uh, the five times a year uh, injectable in the oil. I forget what the name of it is. is I mean, that's eight hundred dollars a dose. The Cipro. So, uh, there, there's a testosterone. That's that's a, a long acting testosterone. Enthanaid, Ciprope, which is mixed. I know we, I, it's not that much for my patients. They will prefer to get testosterone in Cialis from me because it's cheaper than good RX or the pharmacy. So you can, are we, can we stop the recording? <laughs> yeah, hold on.